Hello everyone, and welcome to Imagine Verse. So we are back with an interesting movie on what if Naruto had the legacy of Sea God. But before we start, I just want to remind you to please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button if you enjoy my content. Let's start the story. Princess Vivi, it's time to go, Pell called out, standing a few meters away from where the princess of Alabaster was entertaining a group of children. The sun was beginning to get low, and they were supposed to fly back to their lodge over an hour ago, but Vivi had insisted on staying longer when a group of children appeared. The group of a dozen children had stared at the beautiful princess in awe, in disbelief that they were looking at royalty. They all looked young, and none appeared over the age of ten. Vivi being the person she was didn't have the heart to leave then and there, postponing their departure and deciding to spend the time with some of her younger subjects. There was little the strongest warrior in Alabaster could do, so he did his duty and stood guard off to the side, protecting his princess as he always would. Though he wouldn't deny, a smile did work its way on his face as he watched the delight break out on the children's faces. The seventeen-year-old royal had always had a way with children and the younger members of her country. I know, Pell, just a few more minutes, Vivi replied, sitting beneath a tree with one of the girls crouched next to her. Her hands were working their way through the girl's caramel-colored hair, expertly weaving her hair into a braid, how does that feel, sweetie? Good, thank you, princess, the young Blunanette giggled from the delight in the girl's voice, you're welcome. She turned and looked at another girl who was patiently waiting for her turn, you're up, honey. The girl didn't waste any time and dove to the ground in front of her, causing Vivi's giggles to continue. Pell sighed, by the looks of it, they wouldn't be leaving for a while longer. I hope the king doesn't find out she walked all over me again. Knowing the king of Alabaster as well as he did, he would likely laugh at his predicament. Vivi had a habit of wearing her heart on her sleeve, and once she saw the children waiting for her, there was no chance she was going to disappoint them. It wasn't in her nature to let people down. Weeks after Crocodile was sent packing by the Strafut crew, Vivi had made it her mission to visit every town and port across the desert kingdom. A year later, she was making good on her promise, and her family had benefited from her dedication. The king and princess were more beloved in their country than ever before. It was an honor to protect them, and he would do so with his life. I love your hair, princess. It's blue, like the sea. It is, isn't it? Vivi replied, her smile never wavering, but I love your hair too. It's golden like the alabaster sand, and it feels so silky. I bet you take good care of it. Ooh -hoo. I get it from my daddy, who says I have the prettiest hair in all of alabaster. My dad would say the same thing, and would always smile this big goofy smile when he said it. Dads are goofy, aren't they, princess? The girl replied, causing Vivi to break out into giggles again. Her giggling got louder when the girl's stomach rumbled. It was so loud it reminded her of a certain pirate captain who wore a straw hat, my goodness. It sounds like someone is ready for their dinner. The girl didn't say anything but merely nodded. Her cheeks dusted with red, embarrassed that her stomach made such a loud noise. Do you know what you're having for tea tonight? I bet your parents are wonderful cooks. No, she said quietly, though turned her head to look up at Vivi, forcing the blue net to pull her hands away, I wanted ramen, but my mama said no. She puffed out her cheeks and blew a raspberry. Vivi blinked in surprise, ramen. She heard of the dish before, but if her memory served her right, she didn't think she'd ever had it before. She was sure it wasn't something one could find in alabaster unless someone who'd been out of the country brought it back. Maybe her father had tried it in the past during one of his trips outside of the kingdom, but she was sure it was one she had never had before. So, your parents make ramen for you. That's not a dish I'm very familiar with. She admitted, is it nice? It sounds nice. She nodded her head in excitement, her eyes lighting up, it's amazing. But my mommy and daddy don't make it. Mr. Naruto does. Vivi tilted her head, Mr. Naruto. Again, she nodded, uhu. His boat is with all the other big ones, and serves ramen at the port in his ship stand. Her face deflated of excitement, I wanted to go again, but my parents said no. He's only here for a few more days before he leaves for the next island. Boo. A boat down by the port, huh? Vivi asked, 
letting her mind wander as her hands idly worked on the girl's hair. From the sounds of it, Mr. Naruto must have been a traveling chef, and his boat was a floating restaurant. They weren't uncommon in their part of the world, but Nanohana was a trading port. Most of the goings-on was goods and materials coming in and out of the kingdom. There were a couple of places restaurants and places to eat, but nothing like ships selling food. Is Mr. Naruto's floating restaurant popular? She asked, and felt the girl move her head up and down. He's busy a lot, but we always get a seat at the counter. That way we can watch him work and talk to him too. He's so funny, and his girlfriend is so pretty. The little girl hummed, before adding, she has hair like yours too. But it's much lighter. Mommy once slapped daddy on the head cause he was staring too much. As that's so, her interest was piqued. Off to the side, her protector had heard every part of the conversation and couldn't help but let out a sigh. It looked like they weren't returning to the capital for a little while longer. Later that day, let's see, where could it be, where could it be? Vivi muttered to herself, her sandals clicking against the stone walkway of the harbor. Following closely behind her, Pell followed his charge as always, eyes always scanning the crowd of people that formed wherever the princess went. His hand remained close to his sword if the unlikely ended up happening. Despite having her back to him, he knew her eyes were taking in every little detail of the ships, briefly admiring how different they each were before moving along to the next. It was no secret how much the princess desired to go back out to sea, and traveled the world as she did during her brief time with the Strafuts, but ultimately, she knew her place was in Alabaster. As a princess, she had a duty to uphold, but that didn't mean he couldn't enjoy the colorful and exotic splendors that happened to wash up on their shores. Vivi treasured her moments at sea, but the kingdom of Alabaster came first, and that would never change. Any luck Pell? she asked, a frown on her face as they were beginning to reach the end of the pier. Perhaps the boat left early and was on their way to the next island. If they had made port a month ago, they may have been waiting for the log post to adjust. Regular compasses didn't work on the Grand Line after all. Sailors couldn't go to the next destination until adjusting to the magnetic waves of the island. It took a couple of days, at the least from Alabaster to the next island. Each island was different. None yet, Princess. Her protector relayed, though stopped and leaned to his left. Vivi was quick to catch on to his action and looked at him. Pell, the ship at the far end. The one that's hidden behind the trading vessel bound for Kuka Island. He pointed out, I think that's the one we're looking for. Vivi didn't need to be told twice and made a beeline for the end of the pier. It didn't take long since they'd walked most of the walkway anyway, but as Pell pointed out, Vivi slowly began to notice a vessel sitting calmly on the water behind the trading vessel. It was no wonder she didn't spot it the first time. Compared to other large ships docked in the harbor, it was much smaller. If she had to guess it was half the size of the cargo ship docked next to it. Even smaller than the Going Mary, with the majority of the boat painted dark red. The sails were white in color, and Vivi took note of the lack of a pirate flag. A wooden bridge connected between the ship and the path, allowing access to customers. A chalk sign was set up next to it and read, Leaf Hurricane Ramen. Come on up, all are welcome. Vivi's face lit up as a delicious smell wafted through the air and wove around her nose. Vivi hummed in delight, that smells good. Come on, Pell. Vivi quickened her pace and dashed up the bridge. Pell reached out and tried to tell her to slow down, but she was already out of reach. He sighed, sometimes I forget she's only seventeen. The princess had more energy than he did on a good day. Reaching the top of the ship, Vivi glanced around and took in her new surroundings. The front of the aft resembled a large food stall, with the addition of half a dozen tables and chairs dotting around, leaving enough room for people to walk around. The kitchen held a long counter at the front, enough for five people to occupy the space. She spied all kind of cooking equipment inside, though she would admit, she didn't know the names and could see a pair of people moving around inside. Around the ship, fairy lights gently lit up the deck, and she counted about ten people currently occupying tables and seats. Above the counter, the name, Leaf Hurricane Ramen, was written in white. As soon as she appeared on the boat, the other customers were quick to notice, standing up from their seats to bow and curtsy. Vivi's hands rose, 
asking them to settle down, it's okay, everyone. I'm a customer like all of you. Please, continue your meals. Don't let me distract you. Hell looked around, I can't see any waiters or waitresses. Do we wait, or take a seat anywhere? Take a seat anywhere you like. As long as no one's occupying the space already, a voice said. Vivi and Pell both turned their heads and watched a woman appear through the door, pushing it open with her hip as she balanced two large bowls on a tray. One look at the woman's light blue hair, which fell past her shoulders in a long wave, Vivi knew it was the woman the little girl mentioned earlier in the evening, all right boys, here are your orders. When I come back, I don't want to see anything left in those bowls, you hear? Yes, ma'am, of course, good boys, she winked at them, before leaving their table and looking over to Vivi and Pell, table for two. We've got a couple of tables available, or you can sit at the counter if you like. Pell looked at Vivi, who only took a moment to think before asking, can we sit at the counter? Of course, princess, Nojiko bowed and ushered them over to their seats, and thank you for visiting us. You're officially the first royal to ever visit our humble ship. I'm delighted, Vivi smiled, and accepted the menu her fellow bluenet handed to them, how did you know I'm a princess? The look she got back from the woman made her chuckle in embarrassment, am I that obvious? Her fellow bluenet smiled, if it wasn't for the clothes and jewelry screaming high class, then the way people just bowed to you as a giveaway. The older woman then gave a short curtsy, I'm Nojiko, one of the owners of the Leaf Hurricane. It's an honor to meet you, Princess Vivi. Vivi opened her mouth to speak before suddenly frowning. Nojiko, where did she hear that name? She knew it, but for the life of her, she couldn't place where. It was on the tip of her tongue but just shy out of reach. Naruto, come over and say hello. Nojiko called, turning around and looking in the back. It was only now that the princess realized a young man was standing in the background, putting the finishing touches on a pair of ramen bowls. He was tall, with blonde hair that reminded her of another blonde-haired chef, though much shorter. He was tanned like his blue-net partner and looked in good shape if the way his arms rippled with lean muscle. She idly noticed the long running scar that traveled his right hand all the way along his arm, the rest covered by his white shirt. Not to mention, the cute-looking whisker marks on each of his cheeks. One second, Nojiko, he replied, his tongue sticking between his lips as he finished each bowl, hum, yeah, that's good. He crossed his fingers together, and both Vivi and Pell watched as an identical Naruto appeared next to him, two spicy pork ramen for table two. The clone nodded and left, leaving Naruto to throw a small towel over his shoulder and appeared next to Nojiko, hey, it's nice to meet you both. I'm Naruto, he gave a short bow to Vivi. Vivi, meanwhile, gaped at him turning back towards Naruto and the clone moving past her. H how did you do that? She asked, did you eat a devil fruit? She'd seen plenty of strange things from people who'd eaten devil fruits. Pell was one of those people. A devil fruit? Naruto asked, smiling, with Nojiko smiling next to him, nope. That's all me. B but how? Let's just say I'm a man of many talents. He bumped his hip against Nojiko, as Nojiko knows all too well. The blunette rolled her eyes and bumped him back with her own hip, as much as I loathe to admit it, he's a unique individual. Naruto's smile turned into a grin, forcing Nojiko to roll her eyes in good nature at him, anyway, welcome to Leaf Hurricane Ramen. Have a look through our menu, and let us know what you fancy getting. Vivi and Pell complied, letting their eyes scan over the menu, it all looks so good, but I'm not sure what to have. I've never had ramen, Vivi admitted, and almost jumped out of her seat when Naruto slammed his hands down on the counter and leaned into her personal space. Next to him, Nojiko did nothing but sigh. Next to the princess, Pell had placed his hand on the hilt of his weapon in surprise, before steadily relaxing. Though, he gave the blonde the stink eye for making him jump. You've never had ramen, he asked, and turned to look at Pell, what has this country been feeding this poor girl? Pell raised an eyebrow, the best food gold and silver can buy. Clearly not, otherwise this poor girl wouldn't understand the delight that ramen brings. He took Vivi's hands into his own, and gave them a comforting squeeze, don't worry, princess. Leave it to me, and I'll make you something you'll never forget. 
The determination was a light in his eyes, and it took Vivi by surprise. U R M T thank you. Vivi managed to say before Naruto whisked away back to the kitchen to get started. She didn't want to cause any trouble. As if knowing what Vivi was thinking, Nojiko patted her shoulder, don't worry. He can be a bit excitable when it comes to ramen, but he knows his stuff, and he means well. Nojiko looked over at Pell, how about you? See anything you like the look of. Pell gave a glance over of the menu again, I'll give the spicy shrimp ramen a try, please. He liked a bit of kick to his food. Heat in food was never a miss in his opinion. Sure, you hear that, honey. I got it. The blonde gave them a thumbs up. Vivi glanced between the two, before asking, so you two are. She moved her fingers between the two. Together, yeah, we are. Couldn't let this guy wander around the grand line all alone. He's lucky he's handsome and sweet. Nojiko told her, winking at Naruto and making the young man grin in return. And Nojiko's not too bad either. She can be very stubborn when she wants to be, but she's the most beautiful and loving woman I've ever met. I'm lucky to have her. Nojiko gave him a sly look, are you just trying to win brownie points with me, blondie? Depends. Is it working? You'll find out later. Naruto chuckled at her grin and winked back. For a short while, they fell into a comfortable silence, Vivi watching as Naruto and Nojiko moved around the kitchen. The princess almost fell off her chair, and take Pell along with her when she watched Naruto's method of creating noodles. His right palm faced upwards as an orb of blue energy formed in the center and pushed it into the ingredients. It spun around until formed perfectly. Next, he cracked his knuckles and started beating the mix into a pulp. Looking to Nojiko for an explanation, all she said was he was making the noodles firmer. Since she wasn't an expert in noodles, she went along it. That's a strange way to prepare noodles, Pell muttered to himself, also watching with idle curiosity. It was a first for him too, though the dark purple-haired man watched the blonde young man intently. Although the man seemed nice enough, Pell couldn't help but feel he'd seen the mon's face before. He couldn't place him, but something seemed familiar about him. Next, Vivi watched in awe as another copy of Naruto appeared two meters away from him, and together, started weaving the noodle mixture of flour and wheat through the air with acrobatic precision. It was twirled, twisted and folded over so many times, that when they delicately placed them back on the table, there was a sheen to them that Vivi never expected would appear in noodles. Now, those are some top-grade noodles. They heard Naruto say, giving Nojiko a high five before moving on to the next portion of the course. Two large bowls sat off to the side, with the blue net placing a set of napkins and chopsticks next to their customers. Chopsticks. Oh no, Vivi thought. Gulping, she broke them apart and started practicing. Being a princess of a kingdom, she needed to know table etiquette, but she'd freely admit, she was rather clumsy when it came to chopsticks. She hoped she remembered how to use them properly. While all this happened, another clone was aiding Nojiko to his right of Naruto. She spotted mushrooms, spring onions, red ginger, and various pieces of chicken. There was still more on the table, but Vivi couldn't make out what they were. The whole process of making the meal was fascinating to watch, and couldn't help but wonder how long it took them to learn their craft. It all looks so good, she muttered. Be patient, princess, Hell told her, seeing his charge's curiosity getting the better of her. She was practically leaning over the counter to get a closer look. A knowing smile was on his face. She was the same way when she was a little girl, always wanting to see what a garum was cooking up for her in the royal kitchens. Just then, a strong scent wafted through the air and hit them both at force. Vivi's eyes lit up and her mouth formed a small O shape, while Pell couldn't help licking his lips. The smell was heavenly, and watching Naruto and Nako move in tandem with one another was a sight to see. The two were a good team. It wasn't much longer and just as Vivi and Pelza's stomach were beginning to growl from watching their display, did Naruto and Nojiko finish the bowls. Nojiko placed the warriors in front of him, while Naruto did the same with Vivi's. Orders up, I hope you both enjoy your meal. They heard though neither paid much attention as they stared into the contents of the bowl. Pell was dubious at first, but he had to admit, the meal looked amazing, and smelled heavenly. He counted around a dozen perfectly cooked shrimp floating in the broth, gently colliding with the noodles and cut vegetables. 
He smelled hints of spice added into the broth, giving it a small fiery kick he was eager to try out. Again, the warrior of alabaster licked his lips and eagerly picked up his chopsticks and separated them. After one bite of the shrimp, Pell's shoulders slouched, and he took a large breath of relief as flavor erupted on his tongue, wow! Was all he said, before going in for another bite. Next to him, Vivi took her chopsticks and gently twirled them around in the broth and noodles. It's a miso wafu chicken ramen packed with ginger, onions, mushrooms and the works, Naruto told her. Silently nodding, Vivi tried to pick up pieces of the chicken with her chopsticks but found it continuously slipping from her grip. After a couple of attempts, her frustration started to appear with her cheeks inflated like a chipmunk. She heard a giggle from behind the counter and felt Nojiko's hands gently pry the chopsticks from her hand. Reaching into her pocket, she wrapped an elastic band around the bottom to keep them from sliding away from each other. Here, try it now, Nojiko told her, handing the chopsticks back to Vivi. Though embarrassed at her lack of talent with chopsticks, the rubber band did the trick, and Vivi this time found herself able to pick up a piece of chicken with noodles wrapped around it. Nodding, Vivi put the chicken and noodles in her mouth, with the pair behind the counter watching with idle curiosity what her reaction would be. It didn't take long for them to find out, as an expression of pure delight washed over Vivi's face, her mouth turning into a big smile with her free hand cupping the side of her face. So good, Naruto grinned, gave everyone a thumbs up, happy to serve, and another customer satisfied. Vivi hummed and nodded before digging into her bowl as a woman possessed. It was so good she could scarcely believe it. The blonde owner snaked his arm around Nojiko's shoulders, and felt her lean into him as they watched their happy customers, it's a good thing you had that rubber band in your pocket. The blunette smiled back at him and ran a hand through her hair, it's an old habit of mine. Whenever Belmere made ramen for us back home, Nami would always struggle with the chopsticks. So, she would put a rubber band on the end of it. When she died, I started doing the same. Nojiko explained, and giggled, I still don't think she's got the hang of them to this day. Slam! Both Naruto and Nojiko turned in surprise and looked at the princess, who was on her feet. Both hands were firmly on the top of the counter, her eyes wide as she stared back at Nojiko. That's how I know your name. You're Nami's sister, Nami of the Strafuts. Nojiko's earlier smile soon returned, leaning on the counter with her elbow propping her up, I was wondering when you would figure it out. I wasn't sure if Nami would mention me or not during her adventures. Vivi could only stare at the beautiful woman. Many of her conversations with the navigator of the Strafut pirates started flooding back, what are you doing on the Grand Line? The older woman fingers tapped against the hardwood of the counter, continuing to smile at the princess, I couldn't let my little sister have all the fun. I got itchy feet, and started wishing for an adventure of my own. Nojiko turned and looked at Naruto, it turns out it was right around the corner, and I couldn't help but insist I come along. I haven't regretted it yet. And I'm glad she did. Nojiko's hand came up and gently patted his cheek, making him lean into the side of her palm. The act was enough to make Vivi smile at the interaction, though watched as Naruto's attention shifted back to the bridge, looks like a few new customers. Patting her hand, he made a move to the door to greet their new guests, stay and talk. I think the two of you have a lot to talk about. Are you sure, Blondie? I'm sure, he grinned, before leaving the two young women to get to know each other. Next to Vivi, Pell could do little more than sigh and return to his meal. He was never getting the princess back to their residence at this rate. Later that evening, dressed for bed, and preparing to settle down for the evening, the young princess of Alabaster was in one of her best moods in months. Her time at the Leaf Hurricane had meant to be for one meal but she ended up staying there for nearly three hours. Not only was the word of mouth the truth in every way possible, but she'd met someone she never imagined meeting. She and Nojiko were deep in conversation throughout the evening, with Naruto using his duplication trick to keep on top of the orders as they socialized. She found out so much about an older woman that she felt she could call her a friend alongside Nami. She wondered what Nami would think. Her sister out at sea, instead of their home of Kokoyasi village. Naturally, the conversation turned to the blonde Nojiko was accompanying, and listened and smiled as the lighter brunette told her the story of how they met, and how they inevitably were drawn closer and closer together. 
Vivi loved a love story. She found herself giggling at the memory of Nojiko kissing him on the cheek. Naruto bought over some drinks for them to enjoy while they chatted, and the goofiest grin lit his face up. They were so cute together, and Naruto seemed like a nice person. She could only hope Nami approved of him when the day came for them to meet. She would have liked to have chatted more to the blonde, but someone had to look after their customers. Knock, knock, hum, Vivi looked up from the book in her lap, slipping out of her bed to put on her robe, come in. A moment later, the door opened, and she found Pell standing in the doorway, apologies, princess. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Vivi shook her head, not at all. I was just doing some light reading. She motioned to the book sitting on her bed, is there something you need, Pell? Her protector nodded and brought his hand up. Something was wrapped up in his right hand, though she wasn't sure what it was, is everything okay? I'm unsure, given what we saw tonight. Pell started, his eyes going between Vivi and the paper in his hand, I wasn't sure at first, but all night I've had this nagging feeling in the back of my head that I recognize the owner of Leaf Hurricane Ramen. I knew I recognized his face from somewhere, but where, I wasn't sure. He shook his hand, when we arrive back, and you retired to your room for the night, I did some digging. Vivi frowned, but Pell had her full attention, what did you find? A wanted poster, a a wanted poster, Vivi replied, surprise overriding her features, and motioned to Pell. In an instant, the piece of paper was in Vivi's hands and uncurled it to get a good look at the contents. The first thing she took notice of was the photograph. One look and Vivi could tell it was Naruto, though he looked younger. He looked the same age as her, which meant the bounty was a couple of years old. The whisker-like markings on his cheek were a giveaway, given how unique they were. Secondly, he was caked in sweat, grime and blood. Wanted, dead or alive, Naruto Uzumaki, 850 million berries. Vivi's eyes went wide and lingered on the amount at the center of the bounty. She'd never seen a bounty that high before. What did the blonde chef do to warrant such a high bounty? Fell out of the sky, and landed on the sacred lands of Mariajoy, Vivi began to read before her eyes widened further at the next part responsible for the assault of a celestial dragon, and the freeing of hundreds of slaves belonging to various world nobles. Defeated a full battalion of marines, and, Vivi nearly dropped the bounty at the last part, defeated a marine admiral, before disappearing off the red cliffs. Has yet to be seen ever since. All Vivi could do was look at Pell and the bounty in her hands. Just who in the world was Naruto Uzumaki? The Leaf Hurricane. Letting out a yawn, and stretched out his arms in front of him, the blonde shinobi of Kanahagakur fell back and flopped onto the bed, visibly relaxing as his body sank into the softness of the mattress. Kitchens were cleaned, and tables and chairs were away, leaving him to do as he pleased for the remainder of the evening. A hot shower later, he retired to his and Nojiko's bedroom. Said woman was out on the deck, enjoying a cocktail after finishing her own shower. The brunette loved her cocktails. Oh, that's the stuff. Their bedroom had been a compromise between the two. Initially, at the start of their journey from Kokoyasi village, Nojiko sleep in another bedroom the next room over. That quickly went out the window within a fortnight, and the blue net insisted on moving into the main bedroom. It wasn't a battle he put up much resistance to, and she quickly put her stamp on the room. Nojiko wasn't a typical girly girl, but he'd admit, the amenities she added to the room grew on him. A dressing table sat to the side with Nojiko's knickknacks neatly display on it. Dark blue curtains covered the single window that looked out across the sea behind them, and silk covers dressed the pillows and bed. A little treasure chest sat to the side with a few items they'd found during their travels so far, and a painting decorated the other wall that Nojiko had seen during their first few days in Alabaster. Who knew running a business could be so exhausting? He didn't, that's for sure. You all done blondie. Yeah, I'm done. The door to the bedroom opened up and listened as Nojiko slipped off her sandals and made her way over to the bed. A moment later, he felt a body appear behind him, and a pair of hands gently guided his head to rest on her lap. He smiled up at her. Enjoy your drink, always, she replied, gently running a hand through his hair. Her smile widened when she heard him hum, today was a nice day. It was. Business was good, with plenty of mouths that needed feeding, he replied. Nanohana was a beautiful place, 
and its people were welcoming to them, Vivi seems nice. She wasn't what I expected from a royal princess. I guess the last letter you got from Nami was truthful. Her protector didn't say much. He kept staring at me a lot. The man's eyes kept looking between the princess and him. You think he suspects something? Naruto shrugged. Maybe, but we'll be gone in a few days anyway. The log pose on Nojiko's wrist had said a while ago, and the plan was for them to move on to the next island at the end of the month, although, that damn bounty is annoying. It was like walking around with a target on his back. It was four years ago that it was commissioned, and all he could do was hope it was at the back of a pile somewhere due to him being inactive. Well, you did trash the home of the world nobles. Nojiko reminded, a knowing look on he face as she ran her hand through his blonde locks, the world government are a bit funny about those things. He felt her move his head and gently placed it back on the soft mattress. Moving around the bed, it wasn't long before he found her pressed on top of him, her chin resting on his collarbone. Looking down, he couldn't help but feel his temperature rise when he saw her attire. Nojiko wasn't one for heavy clothes, a trait she apparently shared with her sister. Her pajamas were little more than a thin pair of shorts, and a loose-fitting t-shirt that still stretched from the strain of her chest. Pervy Sage would have been proud he found a girlfriend with a killer body. He was no pervert, but still. See something you like, Blondie. Just admiring. Oh, in that case, admire away. She grinned and felt Naruto chuckle beneath her. Are you excited about tomorrow? Hum, remind me, what's tomorrow again? Training of course. He chuckled when heard her groan, oh, come on. You enjoy it, really. Do we have to? She mumbled, flipping herself over, so her back rested on his chest. The blonde shinobi let out a groan when she moved her hips against his, can't we just sleep the morning away for once? We could, but you need to get used to your abilities. You can't ignore them. Nojiko huffed but held her hand up in the air. Both watched as the tips of her fingers began to change her skin turning from soft pink, into a hard blue. Light shimmered as it reflected from its surface as the change washed over her hands, and then to her elbow. Naruto brought one hand up and gently cupped the hand, feeling the smoothness against his skin as sapphire pressed against his skin, you just had to eat that fruit. Nojiko other hand reached to his face, tilting her head back to look at him, I wasn't going to let you shoulder the burden of protecting me all the time. I don't regret it if that's what you think. Though, I do miss being able to swim. A soft smile rested on both their faces and slowly the pair leaned in a kiss one another, holding in place for a couple of seconds, I guess that means it's time for sleep, huh? Changing her arm back to normal, she clapped her hands twice. The lights in the room went off, leaving a sliver of light from the crack in the curtain. I think you love that clap light more than me. It's possible, Nojiko joked before sliding off his body and onto the mattress, but I can't snuggle with a clap light. Naruo turned on his side, wrapping one arm around her as she rested her head in the crook of his neck, let's just stay like this for a little while. Hum, okay, the blonde wasn't about to disagree. Naruto, hum, I love you, she whispered, letting out a yawn before making herself comfortable as Naruto draped the covers over them. Love you too, Nojiko. Are you sure I can't convince you to have ramen for lunch? Naruto called out. Currently, the blonde shinobi was walking across the sea with two tall cocktails resting in both hands. The ice inside rattled against the glass with each step, carefully making sure not to spill a single drop. Gone were his usual work clothes, dressed in simple orange trunks. A red shirt with yellow flowers covered his top half, with the buttons undone and showing off his many years of intense shinobi training. He did try to button it but his blue net girlfriend quickly undid them with a flick of her fingers. She didn't want her hunky boyfriend hiding those abs away from her prying eyes. Her words, not his. Speaking of said woman, Nojiko looked in his direction. She was lounged out across a sunbed she bought during their time in alabaster with a red and white striped umbrella standing tall next to her, providing shade against the scorching sun. Sitting with her ankles crossed, Naruto couldn't help but admire her beautiful figure as he got closer, turning off the chakra from his feet and sinking into the wet sand. Like himself, the usual clothes she wore for work were gone and instead dressed in a white bikini top and a teal sarong that reached down to her ankles. 
Her right leg was uncovered with her toes idly grazing across the warm sand, giving him a view of her legs most men would kill to see. No means no, Blondie. No ramen. She reached out with one hand and took the drink from his hand. Hum, thank you, honey. Guiding the straw to her lips, she took a sip and smiled up at him. This is very good. You're getting better at making these. Well, I learned from the best. Felt like a fair trade. I teach you the joys of making ramen and you show me how to make cocktails. As it turned out, the Bluenet had an affinity for making alcoholic beverages. Naruto was never much of a drinker, but the drinks Nojiko made were delicious, so she showed him how to make some of the basic ones. Apparently, Belmere had been an avid fan of cocktails and Nojiko in her youth self taught herself how to make them. They were all the rage back on Kokoyasi Island. Before Naruto first arrived and met Nojiko, she'd been thinking about opening up her own cocktail bar before ultimately joining him on his travels. Pulling her legs up to her chest, Nojiko invited Naruto to take a seat with her. Accepting, he planted himself on the bottom half of the sunbed before feeling Nojiko drape her legs over his lap. Leaning back on the sunbed, Nojiko let out a sigh of contentment, nothing gets better than this. Nojiko said quietly, taking another sip of her drink and staring at her partner, a warm and sunny day. Cocktails. Golden beaches. My lovable but dorky boyfriend. Naruto snorted at the last part but smiled nonetheless, life sure is good. Well, I can't argue there. These last few days have been the most relaxing I've had in a long time. His hand idly ran along Nojiko's smooth legs, getting a hum of contentment from the woman, I could almost stay here forever. Why don't we? There's plenty of trees around, so wood is plenty. Gently tapping her sunglasses down to rest on the bridge of her nose, her dark eyes looked at him, how about it? Our own little cabin on a tropical island in the middle of the Grand Line. No one to bother us or give us any grief. No pirates trying to ransack our ship and take me away or marines trying to arrest you and send you to impel down. Naruto snorted as he took a sip of his own drink, humming in contentment as the fruity alcohol ran down the back of his throat, they always seem to be more interested in you, rather than the blonde guy who can beat them up with a wooden spoon. Can you blame them? I may catch, blondie. Nojiko smirked as she took a sip from her own drink, if anything, it's a compliment. Naruto's eyebrow rose at the comment, how do you figure that? Well, it shows you have great taste in women and how lucky I am to have such a wonderful boyfriend to save me at my beck and call. The blonde rolled his eyes, I guess that's one way to look at it. He looked out across the beach, a smile finding its way to his face. They'd been on the little island for a couple of days, and as much as he wanted to stay there longer, he knew they'd have to get going at some point. Finding the little island had been a godsend and gave them time to decompress and relax after a long couple of months. Nojiko, in particular, was looking ready for a rest. She'd been working her dainty feet off by helping him run the restaurant on top of her training. Speaking of her training, Nojiko was making steady improvements. He was confident she could handle herself against regular pirates and marines officers and wasn't someone to be underestimated. She wasn't a natural fighter, but she persevered with an attitude that was willing to learn. All he did was show her some hand-to-hand -hand combat moves on top of body conditioning. Nojiko, to his surprise, was naturally very strong and showed that in their mock battles. She wasn't Tsunade or Sakura strong, but it was far higher than the norm. Her devil fruit was a challenge, given he didn't have one himself. A year on from eating it, she could now activate it across her body at separate times or even turn her whole body in sapphire at once. She'd even incorporated it into her fighting technique. What are you thinking so hard about? He heard Nojiko ask and felt her heel tap him on the leg. Just thinking that we should probably start heading off in a day or two and make our way to the next island. He took another sip of his drink before adding, plus, we haven't trained in over a week. As expected, Nojiko let out a low whine, making him laugh, you do that every time but you enjoy it once we start. Nojiko let out a huff, I guess it's not so bad. Taking another sip of her drink. She rested the glass on the sand and sat up on her knees. Naruto watched, mesmerized as her hands played with the top of her sarong until a soft click was heard and threw it to the side, revealing a thin pair of white bikini bottoms. Feeling his eyes watching her, 
Nojiko couldn't stop the flirty grin appearing on her face, see something you like. I see a lot that I like. He couldn't stop the words from leaving his mouth. Sometimes he had to pinch himself. The next thing the blonde knew, the tanned hands of his girlfriend found themselves running down the front of his chest, feeling the lean and defined muscles he'd earned from years of training. Her touch made his skin tingle, her hands going lower as they grazed across his abdomen. I'd have to admit the same. I'm certainly lucky, she replied. Before he could blink, he found the shirt leaving and thrown to the side next to the sarong. Nojiko was on him in an instant, her hands still pressed against him as their lips met in the middle. They stayed like that for a moment, basking in each other's presence when he felt Nojiko turn her head to face the ocean as his mouth trailed her neck and stilled. Hey, Naruto, yeah, there was a moment of silence before Nojiko asked, how long has that ship been there? That's our ship, Nojiko. He got a light slap on the shoulder for that one. There's a marine ship anchoring next to the leaf hurricane. Ceasing his movements, Naruto looked past Nojiko and towards the leaf hurricane. Just as Nojiko stated, a large marine vessel with its large white masses with the word, marine, written across it, was anchoring next to their humble little boat, dwarfing it in size. He could make out a few people in white uniforms running across the deck of the ship as it came to a halt. Pushing himself up off the sunbed, he quickly threw his shirt back on, while Nojiko did the same with her sarong. Looks like we'll need to cut this short, Naruto replied. Nojiko didn't need to be asked as she jumped into his arms as Naruto got ready to run across the water and return to the ship. It looked like their mini break was over. Hey, look at me for a second, he heard Nojiko say. He turned his head and looked at her, it's been months since we had trouble with any marines. It could be nothing, they might not even recognize you. Let's play it cool and see what they want. If they need food, we'll accommodate. Okay, I'll draw their focus and you work in the kitchen. She pulled him down for one last quick kiss. When they broke apart, he just nodded, okay. Everything will be fine. With that, they took off back to the ship, curious about what their visitors had in store for them. Watching as the bridge lowered down onto the leaf hurricane, Nojiko stood patiently on the deck with her arms crossed. She made a quick change of clothes, leaving on her sarong but putting on a pair of sandals and a thin shirt, leaving the top button undone so her girls could breathe a little. This was not how she wanted her day to go by any means. If the blue net had her way, they'd still be on the beach soaking in the sun and enjoying each other's company and getting into all kinds of mischief a happy couple could find themselves in. God, it must be the heat. I can barely keep my hands off him. The blonde may have been a bit of a dummy at times but he was her dummy. It was nice not to have to look over their shoulders every once in a while, but that was the life she signed up for when venturing out across the seas. The annoyance of Naruto's bounty always crept upon them from time to time. The moment the bridge hit the deck of the leaf hurricane, a dozen marines in their white uniforms with swords and rifles strapped to their backs descended. Each one stood single file in perfect harmony and stood with their feet firmly pressed together in two columns of six. Nojiko remained silent as she waited for the main man to appear. Was it going to be a captain? Commodore? Maybe even a rear admiral? Anyone above that station moved to the new marine headquarters in the new world, where the strongest pirates in the world controlled the seas. She didn't have to wait long. She heard him first, the clacks of wooden sandals hitting the ground which was followed to her surprise, by the tapping of a wooden cane as a large man came into view. He was one of the largest people she'd ever seen, larger than Arlong and dressed in long purple robes held together by a thick sash going around his middle. His wrists were bandaged with guards sitting on the front of his hands and the white jacket all of the top marine officers wore, showing off where they were on the hierarchy. His most prominent features were the scars going across his face in the shape of an X, forming over his eyes with only the whites of his eyes showing. Just looking at him gave her an uneasy feeling. This man was powerful, she could tell right away. Waiting patiently, she waited for the man to step foot on the deck of the Leaf Hurricane before stepping forward, good afternoon, and welcome to Leaf Hurricane Ramen. I'm Nojiko, and I'm sorry if we're looking unprepared, but we weren't expecting any visitors today. The man continued forward and didn't answer right away until he stood just a meter away from Nojiko, towering over the blue net, that's quite all right, my dear. My crew and I were merely passing by when we spotted your ship. 
His voice was calm and soft, his expression not showing hostility. An officer called out the name of the ship and I remember hearing about a ramen restaurant that's been making a name for itself for the past year across the Grand Line. He gripped his cane in both hands, I hope you don't mind, but I thought I could perhaps procure your establishment for a bowl. Of course, it's no trouble at all. Come right this way. Despite his apparent blindness, Nojiko felt unnerved by the way he stared at her. It felt like he was looking right through her and into her soul. Trying not to give anything away, she put on her best smile and ushered him over to the counter, where a couple of seats had been put out, followed by the clack of his cane. She could hear Naruto in the kitchen getting everything ready, the smell of fresh ingredients already beginning to waft across the deck. Then Nojiko felt her stomach drop, her expression evaporating when she saw the symbols on the back of his marine jacket as he made his way over and took a seat at the counter. Admiral a chill of terror ran down the back of her spine, her legs walking on autopilot as she went through the side door and faced the man from behind the counter. Of all people to visit us. Behind her, she felt Naruto's hand squeeze her own. He had his back to her, but the little action was enough to reassure her and aid her in composing herself. I'm sorry, but we haven't had any menus drawn up in Braille. Would you like me to read out the menu for you? If you could. She did just that and read off each bowl. The man merely listened politely as she rounded off each one until she got to the end. His hand rubbed his chin for a moment until making his choice, could I procure a bowl of your spicy pork ramen, please? Of course, a fine choice, Nojiko replied, you hear that, honey? I got it, one spicy pork ramen coming up, Naruto replied and set off to work. Nojio turned back to the man, can I get you a drink of some kind? We provide alcoholic beverages if that takes your fancy. The man shook his head, a glass of water would be fine, thank you. Nojiko didn't waste any time and had the man's water in front of him quicker than anyone could blink. Taking a sip, the admiral let out a low hum of contentment as the cool liquid ran down the back of his throat, thank you for indulging in my curiosity. It's been such a long time since I had ramen and marine rations can only sustain one for so long before you crave for something more hearty. The admiral turned to look at the marines still stood by the deck in two files, at ease, men. Return to the ship, everything will be fine here. They all saluted, yes, Admiral Fujitora, sir. Admiral Fujitora, Nojiko thought, watching as the marines left the ship until the large man was by himself. She'd heard two new admirals had been selected after the war with Whitebeard ended. Of the previous two, one had ascended to the rank of fleet admiral, and the other left the marines altogether. For this man to attain the rank of admiral meant he was powerful. Yet, despite his size and status, Nojiko couldn't deny there was a shroud of gentleness to him. He didn't come across as corrupt as Captain Nazumi did, selling out his oath and dignity for wealth offered by Arlong and his crew. Your establishment has become quite well known across the first half of the Grand Line, Fujitora said, breaking Nojiko out of her thoughts, we were passing by the Drum Kingdom some time ago and you were still on the lips of men and women working the port. You must have a very talented chef. Well, he does all right. I wouldn't want him to get a big head but he's very good at what he does. You're in for a treat. Nojiko tried to remain casual, I dare say he makes the best ramen on the Grand Line. A small smile appeared on Fujitora's face, that's quite the statement to make. I look forward to seeing if that's true. He replied and further asked, so, where are you from, my dear? Are you from the Grand Line? I'm not, I'm from the East Blue. The East Blue, you're a long way from home. I am but this ship has been a good home this past year. Home is where you make it. Very true, my dear. Very true, Fujitora replied. Taking another sip of his water, I've spent some time in the East Blue, though not for many years. Perhaps I know the island you're from. Oh, Nojiko said, before adding, I'm from a place called Kokoyasi Village in the Konami Islands. It's an archipelago not far from Logue Town and Reverse Mountain. As soon as she mentioned her home's name, she could see the cogs turning in the mind of the Admiral. She didn't think he would be aware of her relation to Nami who at this point had a bounty of her own with the Strafuts. Kokoyasi village in the Konami Islands. The admiral muttered, I know that name. You've been there, not myself, but an old friend lived there once, though she died a very long time ago. 
Fujitora stared at Nojiko with closed eyes. Nojiko, huh? I remember your name. You're one of the girls Belmir adopted, are you not? Nojiko tried her hardest, but she couldn't stop her expression from turning to one of shock, her legs suddenly feeling like they were made from jelly. It took all of her energy to remain upright. Behind her, she could hear Naruto stop working and felt his eyes on her back. Why you knew my mom? Nojiko managed to choke out, though it took her a moment to find the words. I did. When I was still a vice admiral, she was part of my battalion 20 years ago. The last I saw of her was before her deployment to the Oikot Kingdom in the East Blue. He explained, resting his cane on the counter and clasping his hands together. Not long after, I found out she'd retired from the Marines, adopted two daughters and made her way back home. Belmere never talked about her time in the Marines, but we always got the feeling that she'd seen and done things she wasn't proud of. She and Nami didn't poke or prod her for information. They tried once and they'd been swiftly shut down. They never tried again, we were told she never registered our adoption with the world government. How did you know? A small smile appeared on his face. She wrote to me, you see. Belmere was always one of my favorites and explained that she thought I was owed an explanation for her hasty decision. I was sad to see her go but I understood others needed her more. She was one of the good ones and I was very proud to have her as my subordinate. His shoulders slouched somewhat and a slither of sadness wove over his face, I was disheartened to learn that she had died and at the hands of someone like Arlong. Nojiko pressed her teeth together and firmly set her jaw. That man's name was taboo around her, as Naruto had learned. Arlong had taken so much from her that the very thought of the man would bring down her mood. How could it not? She was forced to watch as Arlong executed Belmere with her own eyes, forever scarring her and her sister. You knew her well then. I did and had I known that Arlong and his crew had fled the Grand Line and taken over your island, I would have come in an instant. He took a deep breath, if it's any consolation. It was I who volunteered to escort Arlong and his crew to Impel Down, as well as Captain Nazumi, who'd covered up the whole ordeal for a decade. We did not make the journey a pleasurable one for them. They will all be permanent residents of Imp Down for a very long time. Good. He deserves to rot. She wanted the fish man to suffer for what he did. She didn't want him dead yet. She wanted him to suffer the same way he made everyone in Kokuyasi village suffer. She hoped the other inmates he was shackled with made him feel like the little fish in a big pond that he always was. Fujitora hummed in agreement with the conversation fizzling out as the blue net took everything in. The next thing Nojiko knew, he was sniffing the air and made a small hum, hum. That smells delicious. I'm looking forward to my bowl a great deal. Well, that's good to hear. It shouldn't be long now. The chef is very talented when it comes to ramen. Nojiko smiled not so much anything else. I heard that and you were singing something very different back on the beach earlier. Nojiko could tell he was smiling, though he had his back to her. As much as she wanted to wrap her arms around him from behind and nuzzle into his back, she had to look professional and keep the attention away from the blonde. She loved her goofy blonde. Once this was over, and the marines were gone, they were going back to that beach for some more quality time together. After another ten minutes of small talk with Fujitora, the sound of the bell rang as the order was finally complete. Order up, one spicy pork ramen, Naruto handed the bowl over to Nojiko, who, in turn, placed it in front of Fujitora with a pair of chopsticks resting beside it. The patient admiral couldn't help but lick his lips as the smell radiating from the bowl was heavenly on the senses, placing one hand to rest on the bowl. Breaking apart his chopsticks, the large purple robed man expertly wrapped some of the noodles around a piece of pork sitting in the broth and guided them up to his mouth. He took one large bite and chewed before a look of bliss erupted on his face. Hmm, that's delicious. Nojiko grinned and watched as Admiral Fijitor dove back into his bowl of ramen, scarcely saying a word for the next ten minutes as he savored every bite. The guy must really like ramen to be giving off such expressions on his face. He made sure to combine as much as he could with every bite, not wanting to lose any of the flavors that came with the bowl. Looks like another happy customer, Nojiko thought, giving the blonde in the back a thumbs up for once again nailing the dish. It's been so long, he looked up at his ship, I have half a mind to invite the rest of the crew down here and get a bowl for themselves, but that's a lot of mouths to feed. 
There are some big appetites on board. We'd be here all day. Well, we're glad you're enjoying it. Can I get you another drink of water? Yes, please. Naruto just stood in the back, listening to Nojiko talk with Fujitora. She was doing well keeping the Marine Admiral occupied, but the last thing they needed was a fight battling it out on board. The man might have been blind but Naruto could tell there was a power to him. He was the strongest person he'd felt since crash landing on Marijoy and fighting the other admiral as he tried to escape with the slaves he released. He wanted to be up there with her but couldn't risk jeopardizing Nojiko. After a few more minutes passed and settling the bill for his bowl of ramen, the admiral patted his stomach, a wonderful meal. I can see why you have such a good reputation. We try our best. We're just glad you like it. I'm sure, Fujitora replied and stood up from his seat. He grabbed his cane in his left hand but didn't walk away, now that that's over, we can get down to business. Nojiko frowned and tilted her head, business. What business is that? His face turned stern, taking a deep breath and replying with, Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto closed his eyes and took a deep breath. Damn. Nojiko's expression froze and from the corner of her eye, she could see marine officers beginning to appear down the bridge and covering the deck of the leaf hurricane. More appeared over the side of the marine ship, rifles drawn and aiming down at them. Even the cannons were being aimed at their little ship. She took a step back and was about to speak when she felt a hand rest on her shoulder, Naruto appearing next to her. His face was calm, his blue eyes gazing into the whites of the marine admiral. Naruto Uzumaki wanted for the assault of a celestial dragon. Bounty currently standing at 850 million berries. You are a difficult man to find. Naruto felt Nojiko's arm snake around his waist and put his own over her shoulders to keep her calm, how long have you known I was here? Since stepping foot on this ship, Fujitora explained. His eyes gave off an eerie feeling, your name has been silent for three years and not a trace of you could be found anywhere. You covered your tracks well. I'm a ninja, covering our tracks is something we're known for. A ninja, so you're from the land of Wano in the New World. I've never heard of a place called that, nor have I ever been to the New World. The blonde replied, I'm from somewhere much further away than that. I doubt you've ever heard of it. The Marine Admiral hummed, clearly not liking the answer he received, regardless, I'm here to take you in. Alive ideally, his cane unsheathed slightly, revealing the glint of steel beneath the wooden scabbard, but dead if you resist. I would prefer to avoid that. I didn't realize freeing slaves from a life of cruelty was a crime. When they belong to a world noble, descendants of the twenty kings who established the world government, it is a crime of the highest order. As is assaulting one of them. I think your world government needs to have a good hard look at themselves if they think it's okay to lock people in cages and treat them like dirt. Naruto shot back, I don't understand why the marines protect them. It is how it's always been. They brought the world out of chaos and established order. Naruto noticed the lack of conviction in his voice at that last part, but it was clear from the offset this guy wasn't going to let them walk away. At least, he wasn't going to let him walk away. Nojiko, on the other hand, you won't let us walk away, will you? Fujitora shook his head and fully removed the sword from its scabbard, you. No, he turned to look at Nojiko, but Miss Nojiko, for the sake of an old friend, I will look the other way and return her home to the East Blue. Like hell, I'll do that. Nojiko stepped forward with a livid expression on her face. As if she would just let that happen. She wasn't going to let Fujitora or any marine separate her from Naruto. She didn't care if this guy was an old friend of Belmere, that didn't give him the right to break them apart. A pair of arms wrapped around her from behind, feeling Naruto rest his chin on the top of her head. Naruto. You know I love you, right? She tilted her head to look up at him, of course, I do. Do you trust me, with my life? That made him smile, leaning down, he kissed Nojiko. Nojiko let out a little hum as tingles wove down her spine to her toes from the surprise action. When he broke the kiss, he looked back at the admiral, and your men won't harm Nojiko. You have my word they won't. She is not the one we're here for even if I put up a fight and she stays out the way. His grip on his sword tightened, and the blonde could sense the man's aura becoming more dangerous and powerful. Even if you put up a fight, Naruto hummed, good to know. Before Nojiko could blink, 
She found herself pushed to the side with her back hitting the wall. Naruto's voice calling out across the ship, wind style, gale palm. A huge burst of air shot across the front of the leaf hurricane, immediately knocking all lower ranked marines into the air into the water below. A pair of metal trench knives, the same ones Asuma Sensei used, appeared in his hands and shot forward to intercept Fujitora. The former Jonin had given him extensive lessons on how to use them and imbue his chakra into them when he started learning wind release. The blonde liked them so much that he got a pair of his own as a tribute to man's memory and teachings. The pair clashed as sparks came off the metal in the initial contact. Both Naruto and Fujitora began to push to try and overpower their adversary, but neither would allow the other to gain the upper hand. From behind the counter, Nojiko took cover and peeked above the counter, watching with wide eyes as the two clashed. A shift in the air occurred around the weapons as purple energy wrapped around Fujitora's blade and the metal turned dark. Even the man's hands turned as black as obsidian. Naruto, meanwhile, poured his chakra into the knives, blue energy rippling across the steel. The pair clashed again, this time the resulting clash causing a shockwave that almost blew Nojiko off her feet and made the air hum and ripple. The top of the ship would be torn to pieces if they continued to clash. Come on. I don't want to damage my home, she heard Naruto say and watched as he broke the clash and backflipped onto the surface of the sea. Fujitora went after him in a heartbeat, surprising Nojiko as the man lifted in the air and flew over the boat and across the sea. The marine admiral chased after the man she loved, who was leading him on a chase to their island getaway and away from her and their home. As soon as Fujitora left the ship, Nojiko came out of her hiding spot inside the kitchen and ran to the edge of the deck her hands resting on the railing. The pair were little more than dots on the horizon, and she could idly see their initial clash as they made it onto the island, meeting in a shower of sparks and small explosions. She had all the confidence that Naruto could win the battle, but that didn't mean she didn't still worry. He was still fighting against one of the marines, strongest fighters, and all it took was one slip up for things to go horribly wrong. Don't you dare get beaten, she whispered to herself ignoring the shouts and cries of the marines officers in the water and on the vessel behind her. Naruto had to admit, Fujitora earned his position as a marine admiral. The guy wasn't giving him time to breathe as he pressed on with his attacks. Rasengan, driving his signature attack into the larger man, the blind admiral immediately brought up his sword, his hands turning obsidian black again and making the blade turn dark. Meeting a clash of force, the sand around them was instantly blown away in a huge cloud as the blue orb pushed against the weapon. Naruto narrowed his eyes, feeling the man's defense slowly trying to push him back. The man's abilities were strong. Both men grit their teeth, blue eyes staring into white. The resulting explosion from the two opposing forces resulted in both men being flung back ten meters, skidding across the sand as they tried to stay upright. Naruto thought he was the first to recover as he ground to a halt but found himself staring at a large boulder three times the size of himself being hurtled towards him at a frightening speed. One quick hand motion and a clone popped to life next to him, grabbing him by the arm and throwing him out of harm's way just as the boulder collided with the ground. Gravito, Fujitora swung his sword in Naruto's direction. The blonde tried to prepare but was unsuspecting as an invisible force collided with him from his left side sending him sprawling into the jungle and tumbling across the ground. It felt like a train barreled into him. Ow, what the hell was that? Surrender, Naruto Uzumaki, he heard and found Fujitora blitzing towards him with his sword raised high. Naruto brought up his knives in the nick of time, blocking the strike, before the two entered into a series of exchanges across the beach, neither giving the other a moment to breathe. Sparks flew through the air as metal clashed and the sound of sharp clinks echoed across the otherwise silent air. From the boats, the marines all ran to the side of the boat, watching their commander battle the blonde. Even from their position, they could make out the two clash against one another. None could hardly believe someone was managing to give one of their admirals a problem. Someone strong enough to give Fujitora a problem didn't seem likely, but then again, this was the guy who defeated an admiral four years ago. Sometimes they forgot there were people out there that could give their best a hard time. Nojiko merely stood on her own, her arms wrapped around herself as she watched the pair. She had confidence Naruto could win. He always seemed so steadfast when it came to protecting them. Protecting her. 
Fujitora backed off, pushing himself away a few meters before his sword held a purple glow around it. He swung it through the air, reminiscent of moments earlier that barreled the invisible force into the blonde. This time he was prepared and jumped out of the way as another invisible force swept across the sand and the water. The shore split in two, revealing the seafloor until the waves came crashing over them once more. Gravity, huh, I fought a guy who could do stuff with gravity a while back, Naruto told him, jumping in the air to land a kick on his opponent. The admiral blocked with his arm, narrowly dodging or blocking as the blonde attacked him with a flurry of kicks and punches, he was one of the toughest guys I ever fought. I get the feeling you're going to be much the same. Justice must be served, and I won't be leaving here without you, Naruto Uzumaki. Strangely, at that moment, he sensed a shift come from his opponent. What it was, he didn't know, but it was like nothing he'd ever felt before with his hockey. Yeah, I figured you'd say that, even if you marines have a strange sense of it. Naruto ducked a swing from Fujitora's sword and blocked a second strike with the knives. A second Rasengan appeared in his hand, finding an opening as Fujitora pushed him away. The blonde leapt forward but, to his annoyance, the admiral threw his sword into his other hand and swung at the air. The invisible force returned, and Naruto once again found himself being thrown back. The Rasengan disappeared from his hand as he hit the ground, but Fujitora was left bewildered as his opponent disappeared into a pop of smoke. Where did? Fujitora never got to finish as the sand in front of him exploded. The marine admiral had no time to react as a fist caught him in the face followed immediately after by a kick to the chest that sent the large man skidding across the sand and falling to one knee. He started coughing and couldn't help but wonder how the blonde managed to hit him with such force. In fact, he could have sworn he dodged the fist strike at the last moment, and yet somehow, it still managed to catch him. If his sense of sight had remained, he would have seen the blue eyes of his opponent had disappeared. Instead, Topaz's eyes with horizontal bars for pupils now stared at him. Pushing himself to his feet, he threw off his marine jacket and rolled up the sleeves of his purple robes. Cracking his neck, he ushered his opponent to come forward and meet him in combat. Naruto didn't disappoint, and the pair met with another clash of force, backing the air and causing the land and sea around them to quake in protest. Couple of hours later, this is really irritating, you know, Naruto shouted, his fist thrown forward towards his oversized opponent. Senjutsu empowering his body. Perhaps you should give up and make it easier upon yourself. Fujitora replied his hockey-induced fist meeting Naruto's in the middle. The impact of the two fists was enough for the ground to shake around them, air pushed away and destroying anything nearby. Hockey against Senjutsu was a combination unseen within the world and it was unclear which was the stronger of the two. Since the battle was taken up a notch, the two men had been at a stalemate. Each landed significant blows on the other, with Fujitora's gravity constantly catching Naruto off guard. On the other side, the admiral was unable to keep up with the versatility of his opponent. Just when he thought he'd figured his opponent out, he went and pulled another card from his sleeve. Both were looking worse for wear with clothes damaged beyond repair and cuts and bruises littering their bodies, but neither was willing to concede to the other. Naruto knew if he entered his Kyubi mode and synchronized with Kurama, he could have ended the fight a long time ago, but he made a promise to himself that he wouldn't always rely on Kurama's power. He had power of his own and it was up to him to refine it and grow stronger. The synchronizing of his power and Kurama's was for emergencies only. Slamming his blade back into the sheath with a loud clap, the air distorted around him and Naruto watched as rubble and debris from their battle lifted into the air as if they weighed nothing. Swirling around the marine admiral at speeds that would have made a lesser man wet themselves, each one suddenly jolted to the side and was sent directly towards Naruto. I hate that damn move of yours. Naruto backflipped over the first piece of rubble and started cutting and hacking away at each one that came his way, courtesy of his trench knives. He'd lost count of the number of times the admiral used the technique. He knew how much it irritated him. A towering figure appeared over him and Naruto barely managed to react in time to block the incoming blade of Fujitora, having blitzed next to him thanks to those crazy moves of his. The force was enough to push him down onto one knee and the tip of the sword was inches from his face. Willing himself to act, Naruto gathered his strength and pushed Fujitora back, 
forcing the man to take a step back before exchanging in a flurry of blade strikes, sparks whipping through the air as metal clashed with metal. I'm really glad Asuma Sensei gave me those lessons before he died. The blonde thought, ducking under a swipe and rolling under the guard of Fujitora and delivering a swift kick to the back of his leg. The admiral stumbled but tightened his grip on his sword, making the area around him shimmer. Eyes widening, a clone popped to life and threw the original Naruto out of the way, just as gravity came crashing down around Fujitora. Naturally, it destroyed everything in its path, the clone included. Back on the ship, Nojiko hadn't moved a muscle since Naruto left the ship with the Marine Admiral. She had her arms crossed and stood by the side of the ship, uncaring off the handful of Marines that stood watching as well. The blue-haired young woman was tired and her eyes felt heavy, but she wasn't going anywhere until her blonde misfit returned. This guy putting up a better fight than I thought he would. One of the Marines set off to the side, unable to take their eyes away from the chaos and destruction resonating from the island you think we should help the admiral. And do what? Another hissed, all we do is get in the way and cause unnecessary problems for the admiral. The best thing we can do is sit on the sidelines and believe he'll win. The same marine released an audible gulp, though I have to admit, this guy is putting up a better fight than I thought. He's plenty strong enough to survive in the new world. Back on the island and none the wiser to the comments made by his fellow marines, a strong right hook to the side of his face sent the towering figure of Fujitora sprawling across the ground. He hit the ground hard, his shoulder jarring as it caught the edge of a dent in the ground, though managed to push himself back up to his feet in time for a barrage of clones to come his way. Hitting the sheath of his sword on the ground, a twenty-foot radius around him suddenly shimmered as the gravity increased and the clones flying towards him slammed into the ground, dispersing in multiple clouds of smoke. Breathing heavily, Fujitora and the real Naruto stood thirty feet from one another, each facing the other drenched in sweat. Hurry and end this battle. If you combine our power, we can be back on the ship and leaving this wretched place before the hour's up. Kurama told him, watching the fight from inside the blonde. No, Naruto shook his head, taking a deep breath as he pushed away his partner's idea, there are people of great strength in this world and I need to grow stronger in order to battle them. To protect Nojiko. He turned his head and looked towards the ship where he knew Nojiko was waiting for him, your power is the last resort. Kurama merely hummed in annoyance but said little else after, you've grown rusty. Hurry and end this. I plan to. Feeling the connection disappear as Kurama resumed watching from within, Naruto wiped some sweat off his nose, this has been fun and all, but it's time to end this battle. I've made Nojiko worry enough. As long as she is with you, she will be in harm's way. I know, but you try telling that to her. I don't know if you've ever met Nojiko before yesterday, but she's all kinds of stubborn. The blonde poked himself in the chest with his thumb, I'm the most stubborn person I know, but she gives me a run for my money. That, I can see, Fujitora exclaimed, given how much of a fight the blonde had given him. The marine admiral couldn't remember the last time someone had pushed him this far and inflicted these kinds of injuries upon him. He hadn't been able to feel his right arm in some time and his back was one solid hit away from giving up. The bounty on this young man is far too low for someone of his capabilities. This has gone on long enough, Fujitora exclaimed, throwing his hand onto the ground. A horizontal shimmering in the air tower above him, going all the way into the sky and beyond the clouds. It took only a moment for everyone to realize what he was doing as an enormous rock appeared high in the sky pushing its way through the clouds and towards the island. For the first time in hours, Nojiko made a movement, arms unfolding and gripping the side of the boat so tightly that blood started to leak from her fingers' tips. His marine squadron also looked up in shock and awe. They knew Admiral Fujitora was a powerful individual, given his rank and status, but they didn't think such a feat was possible. An attack that came from beyond the clouds was unheard of. What kind of crazy power does this guy have? She muttered, watching with disbelief as the meteor rocketed towards its target. From where she was standing on the ship, she could barely make out the tiny figure in the distance that represented Naruto, but couldn't understand why he wasn't moving. Come on, you fool. Do something, Nojiko shouted. Almost as if he'd heard her voice, the blonde threw himself into the air with the help of some clones and rocketed towards the meteor. 
Nojiko could feel her stomach tightening as the seconds went past. That's impressive, but I've had bigger thrown at me. What is he doing? Fujitora asked himself, sensing Naruto with his hockey sailing towards the meteor, does he intend to meet it head on? In the air. All right, here we go. Naruto told himself, creating a Rasengan in his right palm. Mixing wind chakra with his signature attack, a loud thrum started to emanate from his palm as the Rasengan shifted and evolved, have some of this. Rasenshuriken. Fujitora. Nojiko and the marines all watched to their surprise as Naruto hurled the attack towards the meteor, tiny in comparison to its hulking mass. The initial wonder of what a tiny attack would do to Fujitora's own was soon dispelled. The moment the Rasenshuriken impacted the meteor, the whole mass was engulfed in a silvery white vortex of wind. A blast so loud it forced everyone watching on the ships to cover their ears as tightly as possible, many of whom dropped to their knees or got thrown back as a result of the invoking shockwave. The boats rocked from side to side so violently, that many fell over the side and into the water. Nojiko, knowing how destructive Naruto's attacks could be, dove to cover behind the side of the ship. I've never seen that one before. The island they'd called home for the past week would never be the same again. It looked more like a destructive wasteland. Such strange abilities. Fujitora wondered aloud, watching as his attack was decimated. Small chunks of rubble from the meteor fell through the air and hit the ground across the island and the water. Using his hockey, he tried to sense his opponent, catching him mixed in with the rubble falling towards the ground. He was moving through the derbies as the attack finally ended, using clones to keep himself above the ground and vaulting him through the air. The next thing he knew, the hair on the back of his arm stood on end. Fujitora brought up his sword, deflecting a flying weapon aimed at his chest and swatted it aside. An audible ring hit his ear, but dread filled him as an audible poof sound hit him. Oh no, he muttered, swinging his head to the left. The last thing he saw before it all went dark was the image of his opponent hovering over him, his right hand in the air and a blue sphere as big as he was flaring to life. It was checkmate. One day later, and that's what happened, Fujitora sighed, his head resting against the pillows of his cot. His body from the neck down was bandaged to the extreme, the doctor on the ship refusing to allow him on his feet. He was in no place to argue in his current condition and had to resign himself to being trapped between the sheets. According to the doctor, his ribs had been shattered to a level he'd never seen before. It was a miracle he'd been able to treat him, thanks to modern medicine. According to the older man, if he hadn't coated himself in hockey before the attack struck, his ribs, as well as his insides, would have been little more than paste and they'd be scraping him off the floor. Next to him on a small table was a Den Den Mushi, where a deep voice answered back from Marine Headquarters. I see, I wondered when he would reappear. He's been silent for over four years and now he shows himself. Someone like that shouldn't be able to move around freely the way he does. The deep resonating voice of Fleet Admiral Sakazuki came from the other end. The tone of his voice was enough for Fujitora to understand he wasn't happy that one of his admirals had been bested in combat. The admirals were meant to be the world government's greatest powers. Their swords would cut down any foe that dared to interrupt the balance of power. Naruto Uzumaki had now bested two of them. It was a bitter pill for the marines to swallow. They would have to be on their guard should they come across him for the third time in the near future. Perhaps if he came across a pirate crew, he could do them a favor and remove them from the sea. I fear he hasn't revealed his true power yet. I had the feeling he was holding back some terrible power, but what it is, I don't know. Fujitora's sightless gaze focused on the ceiling, his bounty will need to be increased. That goes without saying. He heard the fleet admiral huff on the other end and pictured his desk taken more abuse as his magma-covered fist slammed on the top, did you learn anything else of note? He can walk on water and can manipulate the wind around him. The wounded admiral added, thinking back to the battle. He hadn't had time to react to the blonde's abilities when he bolted after him to begin their fight, but looking back on it now, it was certainly eye-opening. Walk on water, that's correct, I could hardly believe it either. Fujitora frowned at the memory, walk on air using Soru techniques is one thing but this is another thing entirely. He heard a growl on the other end of the Den Den Mushi. It must have been frustrating to no end for the fleet admiral to hear such information. The higher-ups in the world government were going to love that piece of information. 
Anything else? Fujitora hummed before asking, he makes a mean bowl of ramen. A crackle came from the Den Den Mushi until the line cut off, rendering the injured admiral to his lonesome. Apparently, the fleet admiral didn't consider that piece of information as noteworthy. That was rude. The moment the door was thrown open, the blonde shinobi looked up from his book to find his beautiful blue-haired girlfriend standing in the doorway. Long and drawn-out breaths escaped her body, her shoulders moving up and down at a quicker rate than usual and her face flushed red. They'd made dock with a small island known as Papanapple Island, a week after battling the marine admiral and sending him packing. The blonde hated to admit it, but the gravity-wielding opponent was a lot more capable and formidable than he'd anticipated. The versatility of his techniques was far wider than the ones Nagato had displayed during their battle in Konoha and it required him to adapt and recognize the body motions of his opponent in order to learn his move set. Could he have ended the fighter quicker by synchronizing with Kurama? Absolutely. Their combined power would have curb-stomped Admiral Fujitora, but Naruto had made the decision early on since arriving in this strange and colorful world that Kurama's power was to be used for emergencies only. He needed to rely on his own power and grow stronger. Kurama would help him and train him from within the seal when possible. The strongest of the nine-tailed beasts sounded rather intrigued to impart his knowledge and experiences to his partner. You okay, Nojiko? Nojiko didn't reply back. Instead, she bolted forward, climbed on top of the bed and grabbed a piece of paper from out of the newspaper. Naruto didn't get a chance to ask what it was as it was pushed into his face without warning. Biwa, the noise slipped out of his mouth. After a moment, he reared his head back and got a good look at what was written on the paper. His expression quickly dropped. Wanted, dead or alive, Naruto Uzumaki, one billion five hundred million berries. Oh, boy, Naruto, Nojiko said in a serious tone, I've never seen a bounty this high before. You're likely in the top ten highest bounties right now, maybe even the top five. Only the strongest pirates in the new world have a bounty of over one billion. Nojiko held a hand on her head, this is insane but I guess it was inevitable when you beat an admiral of all people. Or two, in your case. All Naruto did in response was fall back on the bed and let the back of his head rest on the sheets. What a pain. The end. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.